This is a live check. All right. We are going live. Let me pull us up. Sorry, I took a minute. We had some. YouTube was yelling at us for weird reasons. I think YouTube was wrong, and they just didn't want to admit it. YouTube's always wrong. Yeah, it's like your bitrate's wrong, and I'm like, it's an automatic setting. I don't know what to do. So that's what happened. If you're wondering why we're a couple minutes late, thanks everyone for tuning in though. This is our Sunday weekly live stream. We do this every single Sunday at 8.45. This uh, is also on a podcast. So if those of you who are listening on a podcast, welcome as well. Anyway, let's uh, get this started. So to uh, start out, let's uh, Did you talk. Still mine? Yours is right in front of you. Yours is right in front of you. Uh, why are you hiding my stuff? What a jerk. Uh, yeah. So uh, what we kind of do here on the show is we go over some overall beer news, some news in the beer industry that might affect your life. And then we talk about some genius news, some stuff here that hopefully affects your life as well because you like to hear what's going on with us. And then we go through a beer of the week and two topics that are uh, talking about beer and how to make it. Yeah. So let's go right into some brewing news to get started with. Uh, we have uh, Atlantic City is uh, one signature away. It might, they might have even signed it yesterday. Who knows? Um, but uh, of allowing people to drink and consume alcohol on the boardwalk there. And I feel it seems like some other places as well. Um, so that's kind of cool. It sounds like that city's really stepping up um, to bat for all of the small businesses that I'm sure are there. Um, so potentially this week, if you live down in Atlantic City or are visiting it, um, you can go into a bar or a brewery, buy a beer, walk out, and just walk around and drink it. So that's kind of cool because uh, it sounds like small businesses need that. As more places are shutting down, that is, uh, yeah, so basically this is uh, so hopefully going to be a precedent in other places too uh, with governments trying to open up more uh, in more unique ways that help small breweries still be able to sell product even though uh, gathering indoors might not be uh, acceptable. So, yep. Otherwise, uh, Greg Koch's battle continues on um, with the uh, lawsuit over the name Stone, right? Yeah, so uh, the, he actually released a statement this last week basically saying uh, that, uh, that he and Sawstone tried to have a settlement a long time ago, uh, and the lawyers did some back and forth for about three months, and then Sawstone went radio silent. So he's basically trying to say, hey, it's not my fault. Um, Sawstone responded to their statement saying they just weren't comfortable with what uh, Stone was trying to push, basically saying that if they were to keep their name Sawstone, they would have to drop the trademark rights to Sawstone, which is very, very counterintuitive, and severely limit distribution, which even though Sawstone is a three-barrel brewery, um, they obviously don't want to limit what they can do in the future. They want to be able to expand outside their own county eventually, and so they were not happy say with uh, saying they cannot distribute outside their own county. By the way, I just got a mineral ad. We apologize for the ads that may be popping up. It's a new thing with YouTube, by the way. Um, it sounds like it's really annoying, and we're trying to fix it right now. So Yeah, let me know if there's anything I can do to try to fix it on the back end. I went through and delete, manually deleted a lot of them this morning. Yep. So. All right. And then, uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah, um, Stone Brewing continues on with their lawsuit. Um, meanwhile, hashtag genus tone. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing wrong uh, with this. Definitely not going to get sued over that one. <laughs> um, <laughs> so yeah, if you want to buy a T-shirt, actually, I don't. We probably don't have them for sale, do we? That they are. Just... They are live on our website. Oh, okay. You no, know, why not? We do. <laughs> All right. Um, also, um, speaking about breweries feeling the pinch, um, sounds like some breweries around the nation are are kind of finally thrown in the towel uh, when it comes to Skull Mechanic Brewing and Mustache Brewing, um, and it kind of sucks because it sounds like they both had. Um, very community-based um, business models where they wanted people in a tap room um, focused on you know live music, lots of fun events. Um, so obviously they're getting hit hardest. Um, while Bell's Brewing, um, which is a very large uh, brewery, if those of you out there are aware, um, is actually expanding their distribution into, I believe, Oklahoma now. Um, so they're in most states by now. And um, so this kind of brings up the question for me of, of you know, our are you at a huge disadvantage if you don't have a large um, amount of capital invested in a canning line and distribution? 
Uh, and definitely, yeah, there's a lot of small breweries that uh, also don't know how to get all the government resources that come to them. And uh, there's a lot of large breweries that have the best lawyers and accountants basically snagging up every penny. Yeah. Because uh, a lot of that in the first round of PPP was labor-based, meaning large breweries, even if they're doing better or they're expanding distribution during this time, they're still getting all that free government funding that's subsidized. And so they're making out uh, like, a, like a robber thief person. Yeah. And so it's yeah. I mean, it's a tricky situation. I feel like it's nothing new though. Bandits. Um, the making out like bandits. The small That's guy, the word. The small guys always seem to get the brunt of things. So, um, somebody said if we can pause during ads, um, I would. But there is usually a you know ten to thirty second um, delay. So. I, I doubt my pauses would be synchronized with the ads, unfortunately. Let's see if I can um, do something to stop the ads. All right. Yeah, you go do that. I'll go. I'll uh, keep going through some genus news. Um, so let's uh, start out with uh, some Belgian IPA that we uh, made up here. And I think we did a two-barrel batch of that, if I remember correctly. Uh, Belgian IPA slash strong ale slash triple Belgian something. I, I don't really know. All I know is Tim was throwing pounds and pounds of hops at this beer and and the and the OG was uh like like eleven on it or something like that. It was one point like one something. So it was way the heck up there. So it's gonna be a big beer. And um yeah, otherwise uh we got some Blickman stuff finally coming in, uh, specifically the anvils. Um and I think we ordered some other supplies from them, right? From uh, yeah, so yeah. we got some uh, anvil foundries coming in, some 10.5s on that. And then we also got some fun oxygenation kits, some ways that people can oxygenate their beers. As well as I saw they have this like a uh, cooling rod looking thing that sticks into a carboy stopper. Oh, yeah. So One of those things, a little piece If you already have some glycol, it's a pretty easy way to go ahead and, you know, add some stuff to oh, your things. Oh, I see. Okay, yeah. So it's glycol based. That's nice. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we got our Blickman supplies finally coming in. So I'm excited for that because we have had a ton of people wanting those anvils um, and they're a great product. So, yeah, um, we also started uh, seltzer trials here. So hard seltzers, obviously a thing now. And uh, it turns out there is a ton of different methods to make them and a ton of different sort of uh, I, don't, I don't know what the, the word to say is like different ideas of, of what people think is the right or wrong way to do them. Yeah. So, so we are, we currently have three different variations going right now. We just started them doing five gallon batches. Um, so we're going to be playing around with those. We're going to be experimenting, figure out which, um, one turns out the best and then obviously sharing those results with you yeah so right now basically what we have is a yeast experiment we have three different seltzers going on one with bubbles from imperial one with a saison yeast and then one with classic ec 1118 which is the most common yeast that you see in recipes also uh, let me know if the ad problem is fixed on that i think i got it taken care of but yeah, i haven't seen let it me anymore, know more so yeah the bubbles that, <clears> i'm gonna <throat> laugh when the bubbles is the one because that's a yeast yeah, that okay, was like yeah. months and months back and we can't get it anymore <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, um, otherwise we also had our first impressions of uh, pog yeast from speaking of Imperial. Yeah, um, that is the the seasonal A37. So um, we pitched that into a sort juicy of juicy IPA yeah, into a juicy week ago, week and a half ago now. And, yeah, and it's uh, dried out more than we thought it was. And it's actually yeah. uh, almost because we fermented that on the warmer end of the temperature spectrum. Yeah, 100. Yeah. <laughs> it was hot. So, uh, but it's coming across a little bit farmhousey. Uh, so maybe that uh, the super juiciness from Pog comes at a little bit lower temperature than we were expecting. And at the warmer temperature, it gets a little juicy mixed with farmhouse. I don't yeah. know. We'll find out. We'll keep playing with it. But uh, right now that beer is tasting super delicious. Yeah, so there you go. So that is our first impressions of Pog. I mean, we did ferment at 100 degrees. You're going to get a little farmhousey out of, I feel like, anything. But, yeah. Um, and then uh, what else we got here? We got, oh, Caster Muncher is back. Caster Muncher is back. That is our uh, rotating coffee colch. We kind of change it up for different seasons and different styles. Uh, but the most recent one is a great summer edition. We made it nice and light and crispy, which means that that coffee flavor on top pops just incredibly. It's a really good balanced beer, and I think it's the perfect way to drink coffee in the summer. Yeah, we got that back on on Wednesday. I've actually had, I think, two or three people come up and actually tell us this was their, their favorite version so far. So Yeah, I think it's my second favorite version so far. Um, so that's kind of cool. Um, oh, yeah, Peter, you also have something to say, too, by we, the way. Sure. Yeah, on what? Um, at the very top there. 
Oh yeah, uh, that's yeah. So last week I forgot to wish happy birthday to a couple people named Kieran and Lisa. Uh, they happened to be my son and my wife, and they didn't get mad at me at all when I got home for forgetting to uh. wish them a happy birthday on the live stream. And so I'm doing this purely out of the gr- the grace of my heart. That's all right. I don't think I said that to my son. So no, I think I said it to your son on oh. his birthday. Oh, did you on the live stream <laughs> for the win? All right. Um, and then uh, on top of that, we do have a bunch of new followers on Instagram. Um, so if you are not on Instagram, please check that out. Peter's actually been uh, kicking some butt, getting some awesome photos. Ryan's been turning them into some uh, crazy, unique little uh, concepts. So uh, please check that out on Instagram. Follow and then, us on Instagram. Yeah, everybody make- get a, a hold of us also and then just kind of connect with us in a different way than we do with the videos. You get to see a little bit more personality and fun stuff happening around the brewery. Uh, and also, also... We have put out some stuff on TikTok. I don't know if any of you guys are on TikTok, oh, but TikTok. <laughs> it's a fun way to do some different stuff and share our personality with the world. Uh, so follow us on that. <laughs> um, and then to wrap up uh, news here, uh, we did see that some of you out there, I'm sure you saw us through um, YouTube, um, were purchasing some beer kits from us. So always feel free to check out our website. Um, I think I'm going to try to work on a third kit to be put up there right now. It seems like it's it's chugging along nicely. So we got our West Coast IPA kit up there and our Caster Mentor kit right now. Thank you um, to those of you who have supported us. And, uh, yeah, feel free to check those out. Yeah. All right. Well, I think it's time to go on to our beer of the week. Beer of the week. And that is a Category 24C, which is Beer de Gar. This is a really random one i came across but it's a fun one it's I'm a really never, fun one i'm I'll, I'll be i'll be straightforward i've never actually brewed one now i really want to i have brewed a beer to guard and they i'm pretty sure uh when i brewed it i brewed it wrong because this is before <laughs> my my long tenure in the brewing industry yeah. uh so the one that i ended up with when i brewed it back in my fledgling homebrew years was like sickly sweet belgiany uh beer to guard is actually more of a farmhouse style ale it is a slightly malt leaning farmhouse style ale similar to a saison but instead of the the bright pepperiness that you can get off of a saison beer to guard is going to be more malt leaning and a little bit more belgian fruity yeah so they're they're known for having a profile that is um for a belgian beer exceptionally clean crisp um despite being a high alcohol content Yep. Um, so these beers, uh, to kind of put things into perspective, OG of 1060 to 1080 with final gravities of, what was it, 1.008 to like 1012 was all? The uh, so, alcohol percentage, I believe, was 6 to 8.5. Yeah. So really low final gravity. So these are very dry beers. Um, and one thing that it does state in these style guidelines, I'm going to pause for a second. We got a firehouse <laughs> right near us. <laughs> Uh, one of the things it does state in the style guidelines is that these are actually um, lagered. Um, so, so it's not typical of a lot of other Belgian styles, especially um, those ones like Peter is saying that are yeah. you know, huge malt <coughs> bombs, big, thick, chewy, sweet. Um, this is sort of the opposite end of the spectrum. The guard is the storage or the lagering period that these beers go through. So they do end up, like, that, like you said, like bright and dry and crisp, and they're just kind of a fun way to balance fruitier, maltier flavors with dry, clean beer yep um so the on top of that dryness um we are still trying to accentuate the malt character in these beers uh these beers should have very very little um to no hop character at all um so the hops are very subdued um ibus are actually moderate um i believe they're in the mid 20s is what you're going to be shooting for for ibus um but with that said that's basically just going to be a bittering addition i i honestly wouldn't probably try to finish it with any hops at all um if i were to if i were to take a stab at it and uh, and so yeah do do remember that uh you know there's very little hop aroma very little hop flavor um unless you're on the very light side it's all about the malts and the fermentation yeah i'm um, talking about malts for example do we, already, we didn't already say malts did we that's nope. reading you're reading? No, we, we have not. I'm just going over the style. The right malt. Oh, because you were talking about hops. And so I was like, I thought you were on the hops already. Oh, yeah. No, <laughs> we we're just going to go into it. All right. So that's the style. So let's. Uh, <laughs> OK, yeah. let's go into our malt of the week. Speaking malt of the week, honey malt slash brew malt. Uh, yeah. So brew malt is a um, sort of Maillard based malt. It's going to have a little bit of acidity. It's going to have a little bit of uh, sweetness and a nice little complex sugar character. Yeah, so uh, uh, basically what that's going to do is give you a 
feeling of sweetness without all the sweetness that can come from like a crystal type malt. Yep. It can keep it nice and biscuity as well. Uh, and then uh, these malts are going to have a touch of acidity too to help kind of brighten or you know, yeah. lighten up the whole profile. Yep. So beer de guards are known for having um, a very malt forward profile, specifically those biscuit um, and toasty notes to them. Um, and I think while it might not be super toasty, um, the brew malt will definitely give you that, that rich biscuit profile. Um, so I would use that um, per five gallon batch. Um, I would I would probably dose that pretty heavy actually. I would I would go shoot for close to a pound. Yeah. Um, and it is a pretty pungent malt, so I think a pound of that um, will get you about where you need to be. Um, and with that said, um, we are going to be using that on top of you know a nice light pilsner base malt, something of that nature. Um, if you do want to make, there are several ver versions of this actually there's like golden amber and something else brown um, brown yeah so you will obviously have to use uh, some darker malts as well um, if you want to hit um, those darker you know the, the amber and brown styles where you might be using um, additional munich malt in there um, and you might even have a touch of crystal malt a in there. Yeah, a touch of crystal. Um, or like a Caramunic or something like that. Yeah. As, as Got to build out some of those flavors with more unique middle malts if you're yeah. going for the darker end of the spectrum. Yeah. But that said, still start with a, a nice light pilsner base on all those. Yeah. Um, a lot of the golden to ambery hued ones will have a little bit of something like the honey malt that we're talking about, but then uh, build out that middle with a lot of Munich malt. Yep. Um, and then one thing to never forget about, honestly, <clears throat> every Belgian style is Belgian candy sugar as well. Yep. Um, so this is a um, French style, but on the border. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, definitely you're going to want to throw some candy sugar in there too. That's going to get your beer to dry out to those low numbers. Um, I would probably shoot for about a pound of that as well. Um, and that should get you in that same wheelhouse. Um, unless you're brewing those those real dark versions, uh, I would I would tend to stick towards the lighter end of the of the spectrum when it comes to candy sugar. Um, you know, five Lova Bond is probably fine. You know, your golden candy sugars or even your clear candy sugars. Yeah, or you can you can even use some sim simple sugars like uh, regular table sugar or like a uh, beet sugar if you have access to those. Uh, the candy sugar is going to be a little bit more expensive. Yeah. I like the flavors of them, so I think it's always worth going with. When in um, doubt, something highly fermentable just to just to keep that beer nice and crispy. Yeah, but uh, more importantly than adding the simple sugars to make this beer nice and dry is actually adding a diastatic diastaticus variant yeast a yeast that's going to be um kind of helping to keep dry that beer out during the long storage periods uh and so what we did there are a lot of beer de guard yeasts that are basically a, a hybrid style yeast it's a diastaticus variant that you can ferment 70 to 85 degrees and get that nice farmhousey belgian kind of mixed vibe but if you don't have those yeasts what we opted to do is go with monastic combined with cable car and fermented at 75 degrees yep so um that's Exactly, because because what I think a beer de guard strain, a typical strain, is actually it's it's a weird, it's a Belgian lager strain, right, um, or some kind of a hybrid lager strain that's actually a, a diastaticus variant at the same time, which is a very unique quality and a yeast strain. Um, so that's that's why we're kind of recommending actually the co-pitching, um, where you have some kind of a more neutral strain that's going to end up with a really nice crispy finish, um, like the cow lager strain, um, and then as well as a nice Belgian diastaticus strain, so that you get a little bit of those those nice little um, herbal peppery notes in there. Yeah. Um, so um, yeah, and that is our yeast kind of that we jump to real fast. So that is our yeast of the week is going to be monastic and um, uh, cable car from Imperial. Yep. So, and then let's talk about our hop of the week um, so that we don't glance over it because hops are still important. Um, and I chose a pretty traditional hop for this beer style, which is going to be Tetanang. Um, Tetanang is a classic, I believe that's, that is a noble hop, right? It's in the nobles. Yeah. Um, I'm going to call it that anyway. And uh, so Tetanang, pretty low alphas. Um, you, like I said, really not much going on with it. Um, it is known for being a nice herbal, earthy, um, fairly mild profile to it, and uh, yeah, I would probably dose that with um, about, let's see, for a five-gallon batch to get where you want. Um, you probably want to want to put about an ounce and a half, um, maybe even two ounces straight at bittering, and uh, and then more or less call that a day. So um, boil that for, fit for for 60 minutes, and uh, yeah, it should get you in that 20-ish IBU range. See, I thought you talked about that when you were talking about the style when I jumped into the... Yeah, no, I didn't. That's all right. But you, you said, it yeah, it doesn't really matter though. It's a 60 <laughs> minute edition. You can use anything in that noble slash peppery range. Yeah, yeah. If if you don't want to use tetanang, you know, hollow towel would be would be another you know good straightforward one too. Even pearl, I don't see anything wrong with that. Sterling, sterling, yep. whatever. 
Um, Water profile. Let's talk about something more interesting in the style. So this, uh, there, there, there can be a range of water profiles and generally you're not looking for anything too aggressive, uh, but something that leans slightly minerally can actually help balance the farmhouse feel of the beer. Uh, yeah. So we, uh, we actually looked up uh, the water profile and had a really hard time nailing it down um, for a beer to guard. It seems like this style is just obscure enough that um, there's not a lot of data out there. Um, but what I can say is that we looked up um, general French, Belgian, German profiles, um, and it's it seems like you want a fairly balanced profile for for this style of beer. And so, um, if you guys happen to you know be in a place that has a lot of beer to guards and know the know the profile of it, please uh, comment down below and call us out. But what I'm going to take a stab at is to go for a moderate to high bicarbonate load um, in that sort of 100 to 200 ppm range. I know that's a huge range, but um, so that's going to be the bicarb load um, with dissolved calcium in that 50 to 100 range. Um, and then uh, a chloride to sulfate ratio of slightly higher on the chlorides, if not pretty well balanced. Um, so let's just say 80 ppm of chloride and 50 ppm of, of uh, sulfates. And then um, a little bit of magnesium, never gonna hurt nothing. Um, and then I did notice that pretty much all of the cities around that area have some degree of salt. Um, so you will wanna have um, at least, I would say 10 to 20 ppm of some sodium in there. And again, especially for this sort of lager type situation, I think that'll really help round out that finish. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that should pretty much do it for the water profile. I know that was probably like a really quick thing that everybody's wondering what I just did, but yeah. Um, yeah. And a little bit of magnesium never hurts anything either, but you probably already have that in your water. So, and you already said that. Oh, did I? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so I, I kind of zoned out during that. That got really boring for me. I'll be honest. Mm. Let's go on to topic number one. Topic number one is something that we can talk at at length and hopefully uh, it's something that you guys are interested in slash wanted to uh, to hear about when you clicked on this video, and that is going to be how is malt made and what gives it flavor? Yeah, so malt is, I mean, obviously a, a major component of beer, um, and the flavor is going to vary depending on the maltster, depending on, shoot, where it grows, depending on so many things, kilning process, malting process, I mean, you yeah. name it. Let's talk uh, about the first and most important part uh, of, of malt, and it's a very, very overlooked attribute when it comes to the flavors that you get in your base grain, and that is actually what the uh, the varietal itself is, and that, that can have to do with the, uh, the species, the breed of the grain, that can have to do with where it's grown, that can have to do with who grows it, and like what the weather was that year. There can be a very, very broad range when it comes to the grain that goes into the malting process, and that has a huge impact on actually what the final flavor and diastatic power of that malt can be. Yeah. So one thing that the bigger maltsters especially are going to do is uh, they're going to they're going to go in, they're going to analyze these grains um, because they're looking for consistency, right? So they're going to they're going to go out to a field, they're going to test for protein, moisture content, you name it, um, and then they are actually going to blend a whole bunch of different crops together because they are trying to get the most consistent malt possible so that you in turn can have the most consistent beer possible. However, on a smaller scale, um, it's a little more difficult to do that. And, and so that's got its pros and cons, right? There's a lot of maltsters that lean into different species of grains and the brewing community has taken note of this. And a lot of uh, brewers are actually jumping on the fact that uh, that there is a big variety in species of grains. So now you see bigger monsters like uh, like like Hugh Baird's doing heritage varietals or like old world varietals that are single crop, uh, and then so they can vary from year to year. Uh, but what that means is that the the protein content in these uh, less modified grains, these grains that are not necessarily bred for a low profile content for like high beer consistency, uh, they can impact that flavor of the beer and they can also impact the diastatic power uh, of the beer. What that means is the enzymes that make it so that your malt can get you simple sugars, can get you maltose. Uh, one of our favorite uh, malts that we use actually is called Heidelberg malt. And one of the reasons that Heidelberg malt is so highly enzymatic is just because it's a breed of grain that happens to be more enzymatic. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so we got all these fun new varieties always coming out. Um, and I think the trade-off with those is actually it's going to be 
You're trading off consistency sometimes for the flavor that you're getting from them, right? It's gonna um, be meh. But, uh, but yeah, so that's that's definitely a trade-off. We've had, had some really big flavors, especially like the Maris Otter ones. Like yeah. the, the Heritage varieties of Maris Otter have been absolutely fantastic. So let's talk a little bit about really how how we get those flavors out of the malt and in the process of making it. So on the basic level, what malting is, it's taking the seeds of the barley or whatever grain that you're using to malt and you are tricking them into becoming a plant. You're germinating them. And so what the plant itself does, is says, I'm about to grow a plant. I need a lot of energy. So it breaks down some cell walls and it starts producing a lot of sugar or sugar precursors inside the grains. Uh, then when that happens and the malts are nice and sugary, the maltster goes ahead and dries those grains out to stop the process. And then they cook them to varying degrees. Yeah. So the drying and cooking process is really how when we start to differentiate one malt from another um, and our base malt specifically from our specialty malts. Um, so um, kilning is uh, typically done at low temperatures for a fairly short amount of time for all of the all of what we know as base malts. Um, and what that actually does is that preserves those enzymes that Peter are talking is talking about during um, the germination step. Um, so that we can still use them in beer. In the mashing step, yeah. Uh, so all your base malts from a Pilsner malt, which is going to be the lightest color, to about a pale ale malt, which is going to come in at three to four units love a bond. Uh, those will have relatively high diastatic power. Uh, usually Pilsner malt will have just a slightly higher diastatic power than a, like a pale ale malt. But uh, once you get darker into that, into like the Munich malts, where you want some more breadiness and more toastiness and some more character out of your malt, uh, the proteins, the, the enzymes that uh, make your beer sugary for you, those start to degrade because of the high temperatures. Yeah. And then, you know, there's, without oversimplifying it too much, um, there is a correlation with the higher temperature of the malt, obviously, the darker the color gets. Um, and, the, and it changes the flavor from... Um, and let's just kind of keep it on the dry side for now. Yeah. So it'll change that flavor from, you know, a nice light um, grainy neutral profile. Um, and it changes it from that to kind of your biscuity profile to, and then it starts getting into your burnt profiles. And then you start getting into those chocolate and those kind of almost meaty and uh, smoky characters as you get way towards the end of the spectrum there. Yeah, so on the very light left end, uh, something that you might use up to, let's say, 60, even 100% of your malts, you've got something like your Viennas and your Munichs, which those, if you use in a high percentage, can have a very nice biscuit toasty malt uh, character in your beer. But when you get, uh, uh, even those, if you use 100% of them in your grain bill, it's still not gonna be overly cloying, it's not gonna be overly sweet. They can come across nice and light. Um, but then when you get into things like a, a true biscuit malt or a victory malt or things like that, in that 20 level bond range, you start sacrificing most of your diastatic power. They don't want to 100% convert. You can't use them 100% in your beer, uh, but that flavor is more intense. And so you can play around with different base malts at that point. Yeah, which is also why we're generally going to use a lot less of these quote unquote specialty malts um, in beer is because they don't, they can't convert themselves. Um, so you, and but also they have way way more flavor than you would eat. I mean, if you were doing, yeah, they you I don't mean, need to I, use a lot of those. Yeah, I'm sure I'm sure your brewers out there would be laughing if like you had a recipe that had 50 percent black malt in it. Like, I've seen it. <laughs> I've seen it happen. Mmm, chewing on an ashtray. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So the hotter temperatures are generally what you're using to get to those like burnt kind of characters. Yeah. And then the lower temperatures are going to be what you use to get that range because it's easier to stop at an exact level bond on those on the lower temperature yep. range. And so when you're getting in the, into those kind of like toasty, bready feels, uh, a nice slow cook is what's going to give you those. Yeah. So there is another. Are you going on to the other thing? Yeah, you okay. go. You do it, girl. There is another faction of malts, however, which are not dried before going into the killing process. Can you guess what those are and why? I'll give you a hint. Um, they're caramely. Good. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> so, so these are going to be all the malts that fall into um, your caramel crystal malt category, and any any sort of hybridized malts kind of in there as well are usually um, steamed um, or put into the kiln when they're still wet, um, and that is uh, and and that's because you are actually. Um, trying to crystallize those sugars in there. So you need the, the water in those sugars in order to have that crystallization process 
you know, unfold. Yeah, and there are a couple other malts that kind of fall into the same category. So, of course, your entire range of crystal malts uh, that need the, the water in there to caramelize, uh, as well as carapils that actually uses that same moisture to, instead of fully caramelizing, it glassifies uh, some dextrins in there and gives you that more puffy mouthfeel. And then things like roasted barley uh, are different than black malt, even though they're kind of kilned the same way. Roasted barley going into the kiln as green barley actually gives you a more astringent profile, whereas the black malt it's going in there after being dried gives you so uh, just as much burntness but more of a soft burntness yep um yeah and so also you know i talk about hybrid malts um these are going to be your things uh i'm like special x comes to my mind um and yeah kara munich um you know anything with kara is a pretty good indicator that it's yeah kara munich kara vn yeah I'm trying to think of another one here caramel vn caramel um, munich kara brown yeah oh you already said kara aroma yep so yeah. all, all those good ones um, are going to fall into the same category. And what really separates them from, um, you know, the non uh, the non steamed or, or the, the dried malts before they hit the kiln is that unlike where the dry malts will, won't leave you with a lot of residual sweetness, um, these malts definitely can because um, part of that uh, sugar caramelization process is that um, the sugars are way too complex for the yeast to actually ferment. Yeah, uh, and so you end up with a kind of hybrid between caramely, crystally characters and some softer Munich-y characters. So yep. uh, a combination of biscuit and crystal rather than just sweet crystal, which we use whenever we can because we avoid crystal malts like the plague. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah, no, there's so many other malts that are better than uh, straight caramel malts, uh, mostly just malts that have um, more complex character to them than, than a straight caramel crystal malt. Yeah, plus we like just breaking the mold and being different. <laughs> We're rebels. Um, yeah, and there are some uh, some specialty malts that fall kind of outside of all these categories. Uh, actually, honey malts or brew malts uh, that we were talking about before is one of those. Basically, that's a, uh, uh, a malt that is done like a pseudo biscuit malt, um, but also treated with acid in a way and kilned in a way that it intensifies the sweetness. Um, common uh, specialty malts that fall outside of that category that have different treatments that are done to them are acidulated malts, which basically goes through a lactic acid fermentation on the grain before a secondary drying process. And then uh, like smoked malts. Yeah, so smoked malts, um, pretty straightforward there. They're actually going to um, smoke them as they are. Actually, I don't know when. I, I take that back. I don't know if they smoke them before they hit the kiln. I want to say they'll probably smoke them before they hit the kiln. Uh, I think there's two different ways to do it. I think I've seen it done both ways. Yeah. I think Brees does it after, and like a classic Roush malt goes before. Yeah. I know from smoking my own malt, it definitely helps to wet it down because the smoke actually um, permeates the husk of the grain more than the, the grain itself. So. Smoke malt every day. Smoke malt. Smoke malts are fun, by the way. There's there's so many available these days. And I like using smoked malts, but I don't particularly like drinking smoked beers. Yeah. Speaking of, we gotta. I think it's because they're not aged enough. We gotta use our uh, our uh, Stein beer. Yeah, I'm sure it's tasting amazing by now. Yeah. <laughs> if you want to taste our Stein beer, come and get it. <laughs> also, if anyone out there needs a uh, uh, a collection ball for a fast ferment or a wrap for a fast ferment. Uh, we've got some extras that we're trying to get rid of. Let us know. Pay for the shipping. We'll send it to you if you're in the United States. Throw some comment. You know, we should actually just do that as a YouTube post. Be like, hey, yeah. comment, comment on this post. If you're in the United uh, States and you, want to, and you want to take some stuff that we don't <laughs> need anymore. Uh, okay. Um, so, okay, what else is there about malts now? Do it, does that sum it up? I feel like we've missed so much. But I guess it, we probably have missed <laughs> a lot. But um, we did do some more intensive videos on malts so there's actually a whole series of them so please check those out if you want to learn more about malt we break down all those different styles in detail through a series of five or six videos which unfortunately we never did actually get to finish our malt tour because because our malt guys cause, moved because rona that that b <laughs> no it wasn't rona it was the it was because joel was out of town when yeah. we could have done it no it was rona because we, we rescheduled and then they, they and then oh, like, and then uh, jo joel rona does yeah and then they rona well one of the two anyways <laughs> eventually we'll be able to do a tour of the local malt house there's a malt house it's like uh, four miles that way if that yeah so uh it's great that it's that close to us and we want to be able to go there and tour it and learn yeah. about malting all right so let's go on to topic number two which is a pretty broad one and that is going to be doing um split batches and experimentation yeah a lot of people ask us like hey i want to try different yeasts but i don't want to 
I don't brew enough to make it happen. So what should I do? Uh, it really helps, first of all, if you have a, a 10 gallon or bigger system. Uh, but what we like to do is take the exact same wort and split it into different batches. We're kind of doing that with our, uh, our hard seltzer right now. Um, our, our strategy behind that was uh, basically to try to eliminate as many variables as possible as quickly as possible by starting with the broadest category of experimenting, which is the yeast. Right now, like I said, we have the three seltzers going in with three different yeasts. And then from there, we're going to go into some more subtle things. And so we're going to start with the yeast one and then break down into other experimentations. Probably water next. And then yeah. last, we'll probably mess with the nutrients, actually, which yep. I feel like it'll have the least impact, honestly, just because they're not super high ABV things. But uh, um, I think it should just because uh, I think that there are some some nitrogen precursors to sulfur flavors that might end up affecting it, yeah. which is why we use Fermato in that uh, in the current batch. But anyways, there's a lot of things that go into it. I and think so, the staggered isn't probably won't be necessary. I'll bet you if we play with that, though. That, that yeah, I don't think it, I think if you added it all at the beginning, it should yeah, still be fine. That, that's that's what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah but, anyway. uh, and then we can start playing with different things like sugar. So how do you get the the most variables taken out of the way as quickly as possible? Uh, and the, the idea is that you're basically selecting the broadest term first and then narrowing down other variables that you need to yeah. get. And so and I, I think the the easiest path to start with actually um, lies in the system itself that you're trying to make beer on. Yeah. Um, you know, I've always been a huge proponent of, you know, simplify, simplify, simplify. Um, it's really easy to make a really complicated brew house. And ultimately the more complicated you get, the more variables you start incorporating into your brew days. Um, which means that if you do nail something, it's going to be that much harder to repeat it. Yeah. And so, um, especially when scaling up, don't necessarily don't sacrifice, uh, consistency or efficiency for sheer size. Um, even though size can be really helpful because if you're doing like split yeast experiments, for example, doing one batch, one boil, and then splitting it off into two different fermenters simultaneously, that yep. can be a great way to, to figure out which yeast you like better. Yeah. And like, and like I say, it's, you know, it's like, I, I think I've said this before, but it's, and it sounds terrible, but you kind of, if you can take the human element out of things a little bit, um, and, and like automate things as much as possible. That's actually going to really help in your consistency from batch to batch. Um, and then that's to the point where once you get that down, then you can start playing with, you know, one thing or another thing in, in your brew house. So. Yeah. Logan's actually 45% robot. And so he's just, uh, you know, he's got a thing for, for other robots. <laughs> what can I say? Something sexy about metal. Yeah. So let's talk about one of the, uh, quick, um, one of the things you definitely need to know if you're doing a single boil and splitting off into two different fermenters, and that is there's going to be variation on when the runoff uh, or what the runoff is giving you. Uh, and so what we like to do when you're doing a single boil and splitting it into, into two different fermenters is actually have a T in line to make sure that we're getting as close to the exact same beer in both parts. Yeah, which is easier said than done. Really is. Um, because uh, one thing with a T is that you do have to make sure that you're also getting the same flow <laughs> into each fermenter. Um, which a lot of times you'll end up getting a little bit more flow in one than in the other. So, uh, but what that does too, is it, is it, as you start kind of siphoning down the beer out of your kettle, um, you're going to have varying degrees of trube in there. And that's why Peter's saying that you really want to use that tea because the amount of trube that goes into your beer, um, can actually have a significant impact on it. Um, sometimes for the better, sometimes for the worse. So it all depends on what you're brewing. Um, but yeah, definitely splitting that off so that you, again, you have that consistency um, of each fermenter. Yeah. Um, speaking of which, you also want to use the same fermenters. Um, uh, generally speaking, if you are using a dish bottom fermenter, you know, probably your traditional bucket, carboy, you name it, um, you're actually going to get a slightly different fermentation than if you have a conical fermenter. Yeah, and so having the same fermenter uh, in terms of shape and size is actually going to play a bigger role than you might think. Uh, for th reasons like the, the, the shape of the bottom can actually affect how the yeast flocculate, yeah. how they uh, ferment. And then um, they can also affect something called partial pressure on the system. So basically, if you have more liquid above a certain point, the uh, relative pressure on that on that point is higher than if you have it spread out over a, a yeah. wider spot. Yeah, and even, the, I mean, even a metal container versus a glass or plastic, um, that that can affect the actual temperature at which your beer is fermenting because they um, conduct thermalness thermalness yeah no really i mean you're gonna get a free rise more or less regardless so you're probably gonna get a lot less of a free rise in the in the metal fermenter than you would in a plastic because it's closer to ambient unless you've got like full-on glycol which you know that's always a good way to do it yeah so if you got two thousand dollars kicking around you know glycol that's a great way to do it 
Um, <laughs> hey, no, we can get glycol units and everything for five gallon fermenters for like. That is true. They bucks. have. They are getting remarkably cheap nowadays. I. I. Had I still been home brewing and not just working like a dog, I would probably be seriously thinking about investing in one now. I sure would. Uh, all right. So otherwise, let's see. Um, so split batches work for things like yeast. They work for things like uh, I don't know, guessing test te your temperature, um, dry hopping, dry hopping. Yeah, different dry hops, uh, fruit additions, things like that. Fruit so. additions. Oh yeah, they're great for fruit additions. Actually, yeah. I love doing that. That's N nutrient versus not nutrient, things like that. Uh, but what about when you're experimenting with different malts? Because you can't necessarily do the same boil when you're adding an ingredient before the boil. Yeah, definitely. Um, so when it comes to um, base malts, um, keep it, keep them simple. Um, if you're if you're trying to experiment with a base malt, don't <laughs> don't add a specialty malt in the beer with your base malt. Um, you you're trying to get a flavor of what that base malt is. Doesn't mean that you're going to have the best designed recipe ever. Probably not. But if but you, maybe if you yeah maybe but if you if you start adding other malts in with your base malt now you're not tasting the base malt anymore. Um, so the whole point of of smash single malt single hot beers um, are that you are tasting very specific ingredients. You're sort of registering those in your in the back of your palate, and so you know how to then use those flavor profiles and beers in the future. And by the way, we think that smash beers are super sexy. So smash beers have are something that a lot of people just kind of look over, or they yeah. think of like, hey, I'm gonna do it because of the hop. Um, but no, you, I know it's really easy to get excited about things like all, all the different ranges of specialty malts that you can use, because yeah. there's so many flavors you can build. But when you are aiming for a certain flavor and you understand that you have a base malt that does wonders for you every single time, because you know what that base flavor is, that you're, that that base malt experimentation is gonna come in really handy. That's how we learn things like we like Heidelberg over Pilsner malt. How I like Halcyon malt over a lot of pale ale malts because I like that richness that it gives. It's a completely different flavor. So we do base malt experiments all the time, and it's a deeper understanding yeah. of what you're brewing and what you're trying to get in your final product if you really understand all the base malts that are possible. Which is why we have like 40 of them here. Actually, we have less now. <laughs> Slightly we, less than 40. We've used. <laughs> 10 of them, I think now, <laughs> or used up, I should say. Um, but yeah, smashes, and they've kind of like faded away in the commercial world too. I feel like yeah. I saw a ton of them three or four years ago, and now all of a sudden I, I go out and I don't hardly see a smash beer anymore. Guys, comment um, your favorite base malt, just to make my heart happy. Throw it down there, throw it in the comments. Um, and uh, But yeah, uh, the Maris Otter 1823, I mean, how else would we have known that it had that super subtle little Teddy Graham yeah. flavor to it? Um, Teddy Graham beers are awesome. Yeah, it tastes just like Golden Grams. Golden Grams. Golden Teddy Grams. Um, so, yeah, bring back the smash. That's what Peter's trying to tell you there. Yeah, go watch our video on uh, Baird's 1823 versus regular Baird's Maris yeah. Otter, by the way. Uh, so let's talk about here a little bit of things that people of often don't think about um, experimenting with, and that is nutrients and enzymes. Yeah, so uh, I have a range of enzymes that uh, I've brought in just because I have been thoroughly impressed with how it makes it so that I can manipulate my beer even more. Um, so that's going to be things like Clarity Firm, which a lot of people think of using Clarity Firm just because it reduces the gluten content, but you can also use Clarity Firm just as a, uh, as a yeast co-pitch um, to make it so that your yeast actually ferment cleaner. Yeah. So, and drop um, out bright. Yeah, breaking down those enzymes, dropping them out bright. Um, Clarity Firm works really well, actually. Um, so does um, Super Clear. I'm so sold on on that two part Super Clear. Yeah. Or the we probably mentioned Kaido San and uh, fill me Kisosol. in. Kisosol. Kisosol. There we go. Yeah, Kisosol is the number one stage, and Kaido San is the second stage. And so uh, different fining agents. Uh, we've fallen in love with, like you said, the Super Clear over using something like gelatin. Yeah. No, so. I gelatin has gone the way of the dodo, in my opinion. Yeah, um, it's well. Gelatin can work really well in some cases. It doesn't always work. Plus, you um, gotta like you gotta mix it up first. Yeah, exactly. It's so nice when you got a liquid that's just ready to pour in. Yeah, no, using those two part finding agents because, and again, I think it's just because they're hitting the positive and the negative ions. Um, Logan, you, everyone's commenting their favorite base malt. You should comment yours too. You're hitting it out of the park. My my favorite base malt. Yeah, what's your favorite base malt? Um, it's probably going to be. Um, definitely roasted barley. Roasted barley is roasted, the best base malt. Roasted barley is the best base malt. If you don't like black coffee in the morning, but you want really terrible beer, <laughs> roasted barley is a base malt. I think actually, mine, mine might be Halcyon. Actually, Lynx Munich malt 
doing the smash with their link munich yeah um we got to try more with their francine pilsner so by the way uh, the malt house that's right over there we were talking about how uh different maltsters sometimes use like uh heritage grains and base grains uh link is one of the maltsters that's really close to us that they've been reviving um uh, ancient grains basically like uh, purple egyptian egyptian barley so they've got a lot of fun things to play with oh golden promise that's a, that's actually a little golden promise pretty good we we hated on that for a while and then we and then we went to the dark side <laughs> idaho farmhouse ale got a couple of bags of heidi uh, on a recommendation heidelberg malt is psh, it's 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 genius once you make a pilsner with Heidel, heidelberg malt you you'll never, never go, go back. back jinx, jinx five. uh uh Double jinx. <laughs> um, quickly, All before right. we go on to other things you can experiment with, let's talk about when you're doing uh, some specialty malts, if you want to try to get that same um, same split batch effect. So one thing that you can do is uh, if you want to go through the same mash, make sure that your mash is efficient. There are some specialty malts like crystal malts and roasted barley's chocolates that you actually don't need to have in the mash to get their full effect. And so you can do what's called steeping those even after the boil. Yeah, so just like... You know, when you start out on your extract batches, um, all you're going to do is steep them like a big old tea bag. Um, and, uh, yeah, we've actually had really good luck doing that. Yeah, we did that um, with our chocolate side-by-side, -side, I believe. Yep. Uh, was it, no, it was the brown, I think. Or both. Did we do both? Might have been both. Might have been both. Who knows? Um, but, yeah, it's a very, very easy way to experiment with some specialty malts, especially because, obviously, you're using a lot less of those. Um, yeah, that brown one blew my mind. That yeah. one was uh, hugely I, different. Yeah, hugely different, but also the amount of brown malt yeah. that we put in those beers. That that's really what blew my mind. I thought they were going to be way overpowering, but they weren't. Yeah, well, one of them was. But yeah, yeah, one of them was a little bit much. The um, Simpsons, I think, was the darkest one. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so some other things you can experiment with. Uh, first of all, uh, probably the most important thing that you guys should experiment with is trying to brew uh, while wearing a Genus Brewing T-shirt versus not wearing a Genus Brewing T-shirt. Uh, from what I've found, if I'm wearing a Genus Brewing t-shirt while brewing, my beers are five times better. Genusbrewing.com. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, we get a lot of people that are requesting that we use uh, at some Ascorbs, do some Ascorbs experiments. So those might be coming up in our world, uh, but we strongly endorse it, and we recommend that you guys try uh, when you add Ascorbs and uh and how much and, and things like yeah. that uh, like we said we usually add it in our mash about three to five grams per five gallon batch that'll be a fun one i'm sad though if we're gonna if we end up ruining a batch of beer from it right <laughs> like the uh, as the as the control beer and we just oxidize the shiz out of it <laughs> <laughs> yeah that would be sad <laughs> got to do a ton of hops um let's talk about some other enzymes that we carry because uh, we've talked about clarity firm um, uh, OptiMash is another one from White Labs, which is kind of does the same thing as Amylex 4T. Uh, OptiMash, uh, basically it's a wider temperature range enzyme that's pretty strong. It makes it so that if you, let's say you overshoot your mash efficiency, it's a great thing to have on hand because it's something that you can be like, all right, I'll just wait until my mash temperature gets down to 155 and I'll add a little bit of... I mean your temp, mash temperature. Yeah. You said efficiency. Mash temperature. That's right. Yeah. You're going to increase your efficiency with this. That's where he was going. Right. So, <laughs> if you, But if you accidentally mash in at like 160 and you're like, oh, I killed my enzymes, because that's exactly how you talk when you overshoot your strike temperature, <laughs> um, then you can add a little bit of Amylex 4T or OptiMash yeah. and uh, make sure that your your beer still does some beer stuff. Yeah. So that's your beta beta amylase, right? It's a um, it's a di different amylase than alpha oh, beta, it? actually. Oh, interesting. Yeah. But it's, it's going to help uh, convert those sugars. Um, we've even used it to dry a couple of beers out too um, right in the last 10 minutes of the mash so um, lots of options there um, which actually you know that wouldn't be a bad idea if you don't want to use a diastaticus strain kind of call back to our beer of the week yeah um, it would actually just be to add a little bit of extra enzyme to the end of your mash and just make sure you're converting every last bit of sugar yeah it's a little bit of yeah. amyloglucositis uh, in white labs that's uh, ultra firm which we just brought in as well yeah um, Another one is a, they also have a, a, a beta glucanase enzyme yeah. that works at mash temperatures called Visco Buster. Uh, and that's a really fun one. We've played with that wow. in the last like four batches that we've done here. And it's funny because we do overnight mashes. And so when we come in, we'll see that that Visco Buster will just like, you'll, like there'll be no protein like settling It'll be on like the top of the ball mash. bearing of proteins sitting yeah. around in the top of the mash. 
<laughs> you take them out and you can flick them across the floor. Crazy. Um, but uh, yeah, no, that, that one's, and I think that one is actually going to come in real handy with everyone that's buying these vertical brewing systems now. Yes. Um, you know, everyone that's got, you know, your anvils, like we said, are coming in. Um, anyone that's got mash and boils, robo brews, whatever all the other brands are. The Visco um, Buster is going to be. I think a little bit of Visco Buster in your mash will actually really help with that recirculation. Um, I know actually one of our employees just through to hazy and um so that he struggled pretty hard with that yeah um and oh i i don't know if i would fully recommend it for a hazy just yet um just we'll because, have to do some experimentation yeah just because you might actually take away some of that those big body um because that's that's what beta glucanase contributes to um so you know maybe not quite for a hazy but for a lot of other beers um i feel like that'll help with your mash a lot someone wants a hop cat what's a hop cat hop cat uh i am a hop cat you're a hop cat? Yes. Uh, yes, I am. Does that mean instead of the, the dog inoculation, we're going to pitch you in? Yes. Yes. Pitch me in a beer. That's right. It will be the best beer ever. We're going to be the first brewery ever to inoculate a beer with Logan. <laughs> or a cat. One of the two. <laughs> All right. I think that kind of closes out most we have on experimentation. That was more just like a conversational thing. Hopefully, you guys got something from it. I like all the uh, favorite malts you guys put out there. Um but uh, yeah, let's go on to some 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 questions, some Q and A's. I know somebody says, "Have we played around with Great Western's high color pale?" Uh, we used to use that in a lot of yeah. recipes, actually. Um, it's it's great, especially for the price in our area. Yeah, we I don't use it as much anymore because we have yeah, I, lots I, of options. To me, it but comes across a little biscuity, um, almost almost too much for a lot of beers. Um, but for I would say it works really well. I've actually used it to a great degree, um, mimicking. Um, German beers actually yeah um, like I I did a fantastic Doppelbach with it um, but with that said I've also done actual like American pale ales with it and I'm not the biggest fan of it in American pale ale um, but I feel like it's just you know like like every malt you gotta you gotta kind of find what works for you um, and, it, and it's not a bad flavor at all yeah and uh, it's it's super neutral too so it's like neutral yeah. it's high color it's pretty easy for it's it's yeah i endorse it we just don't use it very much american amber ale will work really well on yeah, yeah. A, a lot of like northwest styles or like english styles it works really well yeah. and it's just like yeah english styles up, yeah. you can't go wrong with with that malt honestly but i've just even though it's more expensive i just fall in love with halcyon and so i use halcyon for anything in that range yep and then i'll build some color with other malts basically um what someone wants to dry out a russian imperial stout but doesn't want a brute irs uh so that's going to kind of depend. You should be able to use AMG without it completely drying out. Um, AMG will dry out IPAs or things without um, a lot of specialty malts. Yeah. That said, if you have enough specialty malts in there, I don't think it would completely dry it out, but it might get it down lower than you want. So yeah. Russian, Russian Imperials can be like 1018 to 1024, I think. And so yeah. if you AMG it, it might go down to like 1012. You know what I'm going to say too, <laughs> which, is, which is probably blasphemy, but for, for on a homebrew scale for a Russian Imperial stout, um, brew your brew your stout only at about maybe uh, ten percent or so, um, and then literally throw a fifth of, of whiskey or whatever you want in it, and it'll bump it up by two or three <laughs> percent. Why Hashtag not? Hashtag cheating. Ain't nothing wrong with a little cheating. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean little that, little whiskey. Then you have your barrel aged stout. I mean that's that's the reality. Um, it sucks if you don't have good whiskey though. So yeah, don't don't throw some Jim Bean at that. Throw oh, some yeah. some quality. <laughs> Yes, that, that is a good point. So don't do that. Um, otherwise, you could buffer it with some simple uh, sugars as well. Um, I know I have thrown um, honey and various syrups, um, like, a, like a maple syrup I've thrown in there um, to, with great results. So um, those will help actually dry, dry out that final gravity. And otherwise, just cut down on your total adjuncts. I know they should be high for a Russian Imperial, but um, you know maybe, maybe cut back just a little bit on those. Oh, and low mash temps. Before. Another question. Respond to it. Okay, another question. Um, uh, will we do more? Um, will it brew episodes? Uh, ooh, that's a tough one. So if everyone goes and watches them, then we will do more. Um, right now, they're just unfortunately not performing very well for us, and it takes us a lot of production time to um, do them. So we're kind of putting that on pause for now. Um, things are things are starting to get a little bit busier around here so um, unfortunately they they just aren't really giving us the return of investment that we need to <coughs> excuse me 
<coughs> Make it worth our while. Oh, God. Now Peter's in the bathroom. Peter, take over. <coughs> what? What'd you do? What'd you do? I'm dying. Why are you dying? Um, my throat all of a sudden stopped working. Logan's throat doesn't work. All right, so someone <laughs> said Sapwood released their first cider yesterday with... That was loud. With Michael Toon's My House Says On Yeast. Oh, uh... I feel like that says cider, but it might mean seltzer. Um, I did hear about, I think it was Sapwood, doing a farmhouse seltzer, uh, which I think sounds super tasty. I would love to see a seltzer that's made with uh, um, some more funky yeast. And so what we have going is uh, one with the Saison yeast. And we're going to probably try it with a quike yeast as well. So uh, I think that uh, if you're making hard seltzers and you want to make them more beer-like or more interesting, I think that's a great way to do it. Whew. Okay. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm still alive. <laughs> what is the best way to mash while grain drown rice? I don't understand that question. Uh, yeah, I think that might be misworded, or I just am not comprehending. Whole grain brown rice. Um, you want to do a cereal mash with it? Um, if you're oh, if, is that what he's trying to say? Whole grain yeah. brown rice? Yeah. If you're mashing rice, um, you're gonna be hard hard pressed to get any sh- sugars from it. Oh yeah, I should have kept re- reading. Um, pre gelatinize it first. <laughs> Whole yeah. grain brown, yeah, yeah. You got to pre-gelatinize it, uh, but then pour the whole bit of it into the mash, all of it. Yep. So get some nice rice cooker. It just rice cooker the thing, and then pour the, everything from the rice cooker into the mash. Um, someone asked, uh, should I completely replace all my flame out and dry hops to cryo hops? Yes, as long as you got some pellets or plant matter in there some other time. Yeah, that's the flame out. Not, I mean, the flame out. I like to go like. Mostly cryos with a little bit of pellets. Dry hop, definitely. All cryos. Yeah, unless you're buying hops in bulk, the price point is so similar, and it actually saves you some losses in your beer. It's 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 one of those to me, just why not um, situations. So, um, what deciding factor and how? What is a deciding factor and how long wort should be boiled? Um, that comes down to two different things. First of all, how much extra flavor do you want off of your beer? Uh, long boils are great for like big boozy beers. They're good for small beers that you just want extra character for. Uh, and they al- actually produce some compounds that help keep your beer more shelf stable as well. Uh, so, um, or anything you, time you want a high efficiency beer. So also big boozy beers, you might go for a longer boil. If you don't care about your efficiency so much, uh, just do a short boil. There's beers that we've done for like a 30 minute boil and that's fine. Uh, no minute, no minute boils. Zero minute boils. Yeah. Uh, really depends on if you have that DMS precursor, um, which not every malt has. So uh, a while ago, almost all malts had, uh, or under-modified malts had SMM, methyl methionine. And uh, if your malt has that, or if you're using an under-modified malt that would have SMM, then you can get that cooked corn vegetal flavor from not boiling. Uh, the other uh, would thing would be like if your grain stored in properly, um, it can be slightly oxidized, which creates something called DMSO. And then that can also be a reason that you would definitely need to boil longer. But for the most part, highly modified malts, if they're stored well, you don't have to uh, worry about that. All right. Um, I got one that somebody's asking about setting up cheap glycol chillers for five gallon batches. Um, And the one that we've had here that actually is perfect performing pretty well. um, It's probably oversized for five gallon batches, honestly, but that's the chill max four. Uh, it's from it's from Brewbuilt. From Brewbuilt, you can find it on more beer. Uh, Brewbuilt, I, th- I think um, it's like it might be the Ice Ice Master or Chill Max. I yeah. don't know, but it's the four prong one. Um, you can definitely fully uh, uh, chill four different carboys, cr- crash four different carboys, and then the uh, the Blickman rods that I have coming in that fit into a stopper. Yeah, and that chiller be retails perfect. at I think about six hundred or so, maybe seven hundred. Yeah, it might be seven hundred, um, which is still expensive, but it has come down in price a lot. Um, but we're depending on, you know, I'm, I'm excited for those Blickman rods because, um, another sort of hack, which would not be ideal, but, but, uh, would certainly work for a five gallon batch is I have seen, um, fish tank, um, cooling units. Oh yeah. Um, and they're basically like a little air conditioner, a really, really small air conditioner unit, um, that you pump through. Um, so you would pump through some glycol through it or some water through it, pump it through your your cooling rod, um, and those are actually even cheaper. I've seen those as cheap as like a couple hundred bucks. Yeah. Um, so we almost bought some off a of wish for. Yeah, for they're. Uh, so if you're only trying to cool one or maybe two batches, um, that's always an option too. Um, I think any more than maybe you know ten gallons of beer, I don't think those fish tank coolers are going to be able to handle it just just because they're not they don't have the power 
on them. You know, they're like one tenth horsepower compressors in them or something like that. So, but um, definitely enough for one or two five gallon batches. Yeah, exactly. So that's another option you can do too. Um, and then yeah, finding something like the cooling rods that that we're getting from Blickman. So yeah. Uh, what yeast works best for our castor moonshine recipe? Um, we use a 3470 most often. However, if you can get to hold of some liquid yeasts, yeah. uh, the original was a classic German ale strain. Um, they both work. What you're looking for is a very neutral profile with just a slightly malt leaning feel. So yeah, I anything think in that cold strain, cow lager works well. Yeah, we've used the Dieter to the cow lager. I think the the <clears throat> best that we've done though is when we have any of those ale strains is just fermenting them on the cold side and again i mean can't can't say it enough with a really big pitch yeah um, have been the best batches that have turned out for us i mean this last one was actually um the colon strain from uh Lollaman, yeah um that we fermented it with and that one's slightly fruitier but again having a nice healthy pitch uh we fermented it at 62 so um stayed stayed really nice and clean for us have us guys use that Philly sour yeast? No, but it is coming, and we will use it. Yep. Yeah, we gotta start using actually all those uh, big all pitches, those omega yeast. Oh yeah, now. we got a bunch of omegas to try. Yeah, everyone liked the live stream. Someone uh, just commented to like the live stream. There are 125 of you watching. There are 34 likes and one dislike. So whoever disliked us, it uh, doesn't really matter. But uh, if you want to give us a like, that'd be cool. You should do it. Um, All right. Well, someone, let's, let's grab a couple more questions before we close out. Uh, I have a porter stuck at 1034. Any advice to avoid exploding bottles? It depends on the OG, I guess. It might just be done if it's really big, too. Yeah. Um, but uh, just make sure that it's consistent. Um, you might try just increasing the temperature for a little bit and seeing if it drops some more. Yeah. I um, mean, if it tastes good, I would say watch it for a few weeks and make sure it doesn't drop anymore. Um, and then go ahead and bottle it up. But that is a pretty high final gravity um, for a beer. You can um, always zyme it too. Yep. Uh, or there's a, uh, before zyming, my first, uh, uh, my first, if it's a stuck ferment, my first uh, action would be some um, yeast energizer. Yeah. Um, uh, we got Doug's asking about uh, quike in a dry Irish stout. And I want to say, heck yeah, if, if the 100% Brett Irish stout that we did um, is any indicator of what you might um, get as a result? I think the quike would be fantastic. Uh, worst case scenario, you end up with more of a tropical stout, I guess. Um, definitely worth so, a shot. I'd be yeah, on the trap. Definitely, I, I I think it'd be really good. <clears throat> so, um, someone's asking if you can take a final gravity hydrometer reading when it's carbonated from the keg. You definitely have to knock out the carbonation because that carbonation is extra dissolved uh, bits that will increase the gravity, and so you got to wait for that carbonation to knock out. Um, and then the hydrometer will be more accurate. Yeah. Uh, uh, do we warm our fermenter um, once we pitch our quike yeast, or just or just pitch it right at a hundred from from the kettle? Um, typically, we'll just pitch it right at a hundred. It's easier that yeah. way. We just don't chill as uh, chill as much. Yeah, and yes, I know the trade off is that you're not going to get as much dissolved oxygen in there. Um, but, uh, it seems like quike is, is less picky about oxygen and more picky about, uh, nutrients for the most part. So yeah. And you can always add depending on the strain, I guess. Yeah. You can always add more, uh, uh, more oxygen, like the part way into fermentation, not a lot into fermentation, but let's say about 24 hours. Yeah. Let's say yeah. It, the first third of, uh, sugar depletion. Damn. What's the difference between Maris Otter and Golden Promise as a base malt? Uh, Golden Promise is a little bit more, uh, malt leaning. Um, and it kind of depends on the Maris Otter too. So a lot of Maris Otters are actually relatively neutral, whereas Golden Promises will have a little bit more of like a, uh, a light toasted bread kind They're of puffier. character. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. they have a really good mouthfeel too. Yeah. They've got, they've got more of a, of a like popcorn meets Cheerio mouthfeel to them. <laughs> if that makes any sense. Popcorn without the butter. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, obviously no butter. Yeah. yeah like actual popcorn. Yeah. Oh. They're nice. Um, um, definitely play around with them. Yeah. Either way you can't go wrong. Um, all right. Uh, should I add vitamin C small pills while bottle conditioning with dextrose? No, uh, you should get uh, ascorbic acid is really cheap to just get in pure form, like dissolvable form. Uh, you can go onto morebeer.com and get ascorbic acid from them. I think it's like for a lot of it, it's like five bucks. Yeah. So I would, yeah, cheap. just get actual ascorbic acid. Vitamin C has other stuff in it that can taste bad. Yeah. All right. Well, 
We had a great conversation with you today, but I think it is time to wrap it up. We open in exactly nine minutes now, so we have lots of work to do. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Peter, I know you're reading more questions. I am. <laughs> Favorite cheap-ass trailer park beer? Keystone? <laughs> no, it's probably Coors Light for me. Uh, but uh, thank you all for tuning in. Please come back next week. We do this live stream every Sunday at 845 Pacific Standard Time. Um, come with your questions. Um, grab your morning beer, and uh, we'll see you next week. <laughs>